Welcome everyone. I'm Erin Delaney, Senior Series Producer for Masterpiece. Thank you for joining us on this ninth edition of our monthly Beyond the Page book club. Today I'll be joined by Ben Vanstone, lead writer for the new Masterpiece series, All Creatures Great and Small, based on the memoir by James Herriot, which I'm sure you've all read leading up to today's discussion. We want to give special recognition to Trident Booksellers and Cafe, who partnered with the Beyond the Page Book Club for this event. Trident is open for curbside pickup and limited capacity in-store browsing. Visit them in-store 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., seven days a week, or on their website 24-7. Now, before we get started, I want to explain a little bit how this will work. I know some of you, or many of you, may be new to Zoom. You won't see yourself on the video, and you won't be able to speak during the author interview but we do wanna hear from you. You can ask questions by opening the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and typing in your question. You can put your questions in at any point in time during my interview with Ben. I'll include them throughout our discussion as we go along. You don't need to wait for the second half of the event, so feel free to get started right now. And if you see a question from someone else that you'd like to hear the answer to, you can vote for it by clicking the thumbs up sign and move it that'll move it to the top of the question list and we'll see it. We will do our best to ask the most popular questions for sure. Also, if anyone is interested in the closed captioning feature, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options will pop up. We recommend that you select subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window will open where you can see what each speaker is saying. And please bear in mind that the closed captioning may be slightly delayed because uh, you know we talk fast, right? Um, one more thing, throughout the event, we'll be using the poll feature, asking you questions. So we're gonna do a test poll right now to see how it goes. As you will see, the poll will pop up in the center of your screen. You're able to move this window close the window um, or answer the question. Once you answer the question, the window will disappear completely. So here's our first poll question. Is this your first Beyond the Page book club event? So put in your answer. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Ben Vanstone. Ben Vanstone received stellar reviews for his adaptation of Laurie Lee's classic novel, Cider with Rosie for the BBC, starring Samantha Morton and Tim Spall. He adapted The Borrowers, directed by Tom Harper for NBC and the BBC, and also wrote The Last Kingdom for BBC Two and Netflix. He was on the staff of the BBC's hit drama Merlin, which was also broadcast in the US on NBC. And more recently, He's written and executive produced All Creatures Great and Small for Playground Entertainment, Channel 5, and Masterpiece. And prior to that, Vanstone was writer and co-executive producer for The English Game on Netflix. So welcome, Ben. Hi, great to be here. Great to have you here. Um, I'm going to do a second poll question first, get everybody into the poll mood. Um, and we always, I'm sure anyone who's in a book club knows this question. How many of you finished the book? And I am proud to say I did last night. <laughs> um, ben, I think I'm gonna start with some sort of uh, really backgroundy questions about you and all creatures. Um, in particular about the book, I understand you had not read the books until you took on this project. Is that right? Until I was invited to pitch for it, yeah. I was... Um... I had obviously watched the BBC version when I was a young kid. Um, and I think after doing Cider with Rosie, um, which was a, a sort of a, a film about a sort of similar era and a sort of coming of age story, um, they thought I would be a good match for this. And, and then I went and, and read the books and, and loved them and, and pitched for them then. So that, that's how I got involved with it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Um, another thing we should probably do just for the few people who may not know, um, can you just give an overview of this series? How many episodes? 
How many? Yeah, do you- I mean, in series one, there are seven episodes, which takes us through the sort of close to the first year of James's time at the practice. Um, he sort of arrives uh midsummer and it'll be go through to christmas um he has just graduated from veterinary college um desperate to find a job in uh hard times and winds up the only place he can get an interview even is this small rural practice in the yorkshire dales where he's never been before doesn't know the world or the people and he arrives very much as a fish out of water and it's the story of this sort of young man arriving in a new place and finding his place in that world. Um, and without giving too much away, he you know, has challenges with his boss, with the work, with the people um, and the animals as well. But he's also greatly rewarded um, in doing so. Great, thanks. Um, and I know a question that I have and surely many of the attendees on this meeting have is, you know, how on earth do you decide? That book, I was, because I'd never read it before, I didn't realize how very vignette it is. These yeah. tiny, tiny little nugget stories. And you couldn't obviously include them all. How did you decide? <laughs> uh, you read the books again and again and again and again until they sort of get ingrained into you. And, and then what you're sort of looking to do is um yeah there's a journey for James over this first series which is very much like it is in the book him finding his place in that in that in the Yorkshire Dales um and so then you start to sort of uh build that story the twists and turns you go okay well if you're having a difficult time for James um you look at stories where that might help play out that part of his dramatic journey um and you sort of organically find a way to slot them together and it's 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 not like anything I've ever worked on before where sometimes you would very carefully plot out you know every single sort of beat of the entire journey whereas this it's much more organic you find yourself sort of borrowing stories from all over in the novel to to build the sort of through line of that one episode so yeah it's really tricky um there are some real standout stories that have shape to them where you feel that there's a beginning and a, and a obstacle within the um, animal veterinary story itself and a resolution with meaning um, which are always great to build an episode around there's also all these other little colorful ones where they're almost just a short scene but you you sort of extrapolate out there you sort of ask the question as well who who are these people and how can we flesh out that story more fully um, to play it out on screen but it, it, it is a very um, organic process that requires a lot of time spent with the with the material and the book, um, which are great. I mean, the you know you, you're so right. They're they're just these little nuggets, often containing warmth, heart, wisdom. Um, I spent a lot of time listening to one audio book as well. So you'd have you know a little walk, you know, going for a walk or catching a bus. You'd be able to have a sort of little story on your on your journey. So that that was the way I sort of embedded them into my psyche. So you just sort of inhaled and absorbed it all. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I imagine that because of the vignette-like nature, you were freed perhaps a little bit more than other adapters are when they're adapting something that is very, like Jane Austen, you know, God forbid anybody messes with a key plot point. But for example, one of the things I love in the show, and it's the first scene, so I'm not giving away anything, is that in the memoir, we know James had trouble getting a job because he tells us, but he tells us as his backstory. In the series, we're gonna see him before he gets to the Dales. What, what made you do that? Well, it, it's the difference between the novel and something that's on screen where, you know, reading a novel is such an, an active process. We, you know, we imagine and we join all the dots and we're given a, an insight into our protagonist's head. They can tell us what they're thinking. They can tell us that they were in Glasgow and struggled to get a job and, you know, that this was the place they got the interview. On screen, it's it's more of a passive experience where you need to show the audience and play out that action so, so they understand where the character has come from. So I think that's a really good example of how the, it's in the book. 
because you know that in the book he very clearly says that he came from Glasgow, but you don't play out those scenes. So we would take that that sort of inner view of James's life that's presented in the book and create a scene to tell that story for the audience, um, which is the process of adaptation. And, and I do think it's very freeing when you, as you say, have a, a story that's less plot driven. Because sometimes if you get the plot and it's a novel with a very highly wrought, finely tuned plot, there's, it's less interesting to me, I suppose, because you, as you say, you don't mess with Austin. You're not going to have Mr. Darcy doing something completely different because it's all there and laid out. Whereas this, we kind of had to find that through line and it's all there in the book. It's just more of it. It's very subtle sort of, you very subtly see James's evolution as he tells his stories. But we have sort of had to foreground that a little bit more. Yeah. And I, again, because US viewers haven't seen more than a promo yet, we don't want any spoilers, but I think the other thing is, you know, it's vignettes, but it's also a memoir of a real person. So you probably, did you also draw on things that happened in Harriet's life? I know that's not his real name. It's Alf White, is that Alf right? Alf White, yeah, well, we did. And we, Alf White's son, Jim, and daughter, Rosie, were consultants on the show um, and were involved throughout. And they would always have so many more stories about Donald Sinclair, who was the, 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 the person who Siegfried's based on, for example. Um, and yeah, we would, we have to be careful though, that you don't, that you remember you are doing a work of fiction and it is the, the book is a fictionalized account of this vet's life. And he's taken, Alf White himself has taken stories that he's heard and stories that he's experienced it and recreated them in, a slightly fictional sense and so we you, while we did draw on reality and and the truth of who he was like for example he you know we he was from Scotland and we wanted to make sure that our James had a Scottish ac accent and reflected that um it, it you've got to be careful that you don't go too far the other way and become sort of biographers of Alf White rather than sort of being true to the spirit of the the book itself yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's a fictionalized vignette memoir and you're adapting it for yet another medium. Um, I'm gonna just pause briefly and ask one of the questions because it's a really basic and important question. Um, where exactly are the Dales? They are in the Northeast of England. Um, so if you imagine, I'd have to do it in reverse. So sort of London's down here and you go up up here, Scotland, the Dales are sort of here, sort of halfway between the two. It's much closer to the sort of border of Scotland than it is to London. So this is the north of England. Things are a lot wilder up there. It's more open country. Um, it's it's almost a country to itself, really. Even now, Yorkshire, and you know, I think the the separate corners of of England, and it it, it has a character that's all all of its own up there. It's a little bit wilder trying to think of an equivalent in the in the states that I can think of but I, I don't know the states well enough to <laughs> draw but it's yeah it's in the north and it's um it has figured prominently in a number of literary works I think and consequently in a number of masterpiece dramas it's I mean the Brontes mm. of course and wait wasn't Downton Abbey sort of near near there it, too it was up there yeah it was yeah, yeah. So um, let's briefly talk about the landscape because um, I, oh, uh, one of our viewers is suggesting maybe rural Northern Maine. Okay. That could be, um, you know, except with lots of ocean. <laughs> <Instead of more. laughs> Yorkshire's kind of next to the sea. Where, where we are in the Dales is only sort of, well, now it's about 45 minutes drive to Scarborough. Back then it would probably be a lot longer with the roads, but. Yeah, it's not too far from the coast up there. You know, when you guys were location hunting and we were looking at pictures, we were all just bowled over. I think that landscape, uh, all of it, the, the yeah. farms and the outbuildings and little little byres where the animals are and then those beautiful rolling, rolling hills. I think that's really almost a character in the TV show, yeah? Yeah. Absolutely. And, and so are the seasons, actually. It's 
you, you go up there at different times of year and it's completely different each time and it moves and it changes. I, I was struck when, when we first started doing this, I traveled up to Yorkshire and spent some time sort of walking around on the dales, taking it all in. And I'd never been there before, actually. I'd, I'd sort of been through it, but never actually up into the dales and had a proper walk around. And it's just the most stunning scenery. It sort of goes from, you know, up into towering peaks down into these gorgeous little valleys and rolling hills. It's a really beautiful landscape, which we I think we captured really well as well. I, mean, I think the the modern technology that we have now with drones and 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 lightweight cameras to really um, do that world justice and yeah, it's, it's great. Really, real privilege. It's hard. Like we shot in the winter and it can get pretty wild up there. Um, so yeah, but in the summer, it's also stunning. It's, it's great. I love it. I wondered about that because as the film, as the dailies were coming in and we were looking at them, I thought, wow, those actors look really cold. Yeah. 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 I mean, especially there's a moment in episode two that was very, Nick, who played James, was very cold. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> the, thing, the things we do for our art, right? Yeah, but he was a trooper, you know, he, he didn't stop. Um, yeah, the whole crew, actually, there were times on top of them, on top of those dales when the wind was blowing. Um, but everyone stuck it out in good spirits. There was, a, you know, it's, it's probably the happiest production I've worked on, which is surprising given the weather but everyone really um loved it up there i think everyone appreciated as well you know that beauty of that landscape and it's kind of a privilege to be there and and filming it so yeah it was great and and, and that natural world the story of the natural world how it changes as well i think you know, it's a really difficult thing to capture on screen because you you only get to film in a certain segment of the year, but you know, as through the books, I think that's what's something Harriet does so well is that he really captures the movement of the seasons from spring into summer, into autumn, and then and then fall. Uh, no, it's winter, isn't it? Winter. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm going to pause here and just re-welcome anybody who may have joined late. Um, we're continuing a conversation with Ben Vanstone, lead writer and executive producer for our new masterpiece series, All Creatures Great and Small, based on the memoirs of James Herriot. And I just wanna remind everybody that uh, you can ask Ben questions yourselves, use the Q&A feature. Um, it's a little tab that's located in the toolbar at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And we'll do our best to get to everyone's questions. Um, one question I have for you, Ben, I think others will be interested in this is, can you talk a little bit about your two, your two roles, which aren't always combined on all TV series? You were lead writer and you were an executive producer. How did you do both and how did each affect the other? Um, how do I do both? I don't know, that's a good question. Um, I just, I think that for me, they're really intertwined. I suppose, in that you're sort of overseeing the storytelling of the show. And that includes what it looks like, who you're casting, what, you know, what the sort of colour tones are, the music. And that was always, if you're telling the story of, of All Creatures Great and Small, I, I feel like you've got to be across all of that. And while the writing is, writing a script is a blueprint, and it's not the finished building. And as an exec producer, you're sort of working across the blueprint and the and the sort of final um, product, which you're again working with very talented people. You know, there was a number of exec producers on the show. There's me, Melissa Gallant, Colin Callender, and everyone at Masterpiece as well. And you collaborate to to sort of make sure that that vision is carried from page to screen. Um, so it's it's a job which I don't see as separate. I mean, I think the perhaps the the day-to-day -day sign off on certain things is can feel more remote from the writing, but overall you're you're just just trying to tell the story as best you can in, in both roles. Um, so I see them one and the same really. That makes sense. Um, while we're talking about the wonderful people, um, can we talk about the the main characters? I, I personally think of them as sort of the Skeldale crew. Um, <laughs> and 
I think people would be interested in hearing about some of the choices you made, especially about the female characters, Mrs. Hall and Helen and, and how you, um, you, how you turned them into real characters. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that we, it was always our intention that the Scaledale crew was a family. And in my head, it was a dysfunctional family that have all ended up together and all need each other for very different reasons. Um, and while there is tension and, and I mean, as it is in the books as well, you know, that the, while Siegfried and Tristan may go at loggerheads, there's also a great deal of love underneath that. And I think that it was always our intention to, to make sure that we created that feeling in the house. So to do that and do justice to those characters, we had to really look at Mrs. Hall as well and you know, think about what her backstory is. Why is she there? Why would anyone sort of put up with working for Siegfried? And once you start asking those questions, you start to answer them and flesh out that character. And likewise with Helen, it's, you know, we taking from what's in, in the book in, you know, Helen's, referred to as having lost her mother and brought up her younger sister, younger siblings actually, and looked after her father. And, and, and that role, that role both on the farm and sort of emotionally is, is going to affect that person. So we had to sort of really think about, well, what's the reality of that character and what is the truth of um, someone living at that time in that place who had been through that. And from there you sort of, build the, the blocks of those characters up and then the actors come in and, and take it on to another level as well. Yeah they were you can tell just by watching them that they were they quickly as, as I've heard became a coherent band yeah and friends and a, a true ensemble. Do they do the actors ever um, come to you with suggestions about particular lines of dialogue? Ben, can I change this word? Yeah, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always open. A lot of the time they know the characters better than we do because they, you know, even as writing it. And I think that when you are writing it, it's you're across, you know, seven episodes and you're writing lots of material and working with a lot of material and they are specialists in themselves and they really sort of, uh, dig down into what who those characters are and understand them uh, in, perhaps even better than the writers do at, at times um, so yeah I'm always open to hear uh, thoughts on on where they're going and these guys you, you're right what you're seeing on screen I think it really comes across on screen as well is they very quickly clicked into this wonderful ensemble and it was a mix of just happening to find the right people they're all absolutely wonderful people um, who are great actors and perfect for their roles. And it, it's, again, it's a really rare thing where you, you can just feel, you can feel on the screen that they love being there and they love doing the job. And when you're around them, I, I guarantee you that that's exactly how it is. They're having an absolute blast. And I think that when actors are in that place where they're enjoying themselves, they're, they know the characters really well you almost feel that you could just put the five of them in a room and have them talking and, and you would have an episode now. It's like their characters are, are so strong and they deliver them really well. Yeah, we're thrilled with them. That's great. And one of them, Nicholas Ralph, who's playing James, had never done a TV series before. Yeah, never, never done anything before. No, and he, um, I kind of think we expect him to be nervous and... We thought, oh, it's okay, you know, we've got um, Sam West is there and he's an old hand and he, you know, he'll be a good guy for him. And he is, you know, Sam's obviously an incredible actor in his own right, but also he knows the business you know, as well as anyone. But Nick uh, from the first take was just perfect, just on it and confident. It almost, you know, in, in some ways it was art imitating life. In you know, in a way he was like James Herriot. He... I think he did, you know, realized what a big break this was and he was determined that he was going to do a great job. Um, and I think it, you know, it comes from not only talent, but also hard work. I think all, all of them you know, work really hard with the scripts, really think about their performances. Um, but Nicholas was a, is a revelation and um, yeah, we're so lucky to have him. And we love um, 
the fact that Callum Woodhouse too was a first time TV series actor for a series that was previously on Masterpiece, The Durrells and Corfu. I think you can sort of imagine them sharing, you know, what it's like to suddenly find yourself plunged into the crazy world of TV series production. One other actor I'd love to talk about is, and I see some of the chat questions are about her, is our beloved Diana Rigg, who was mystery series host for us for many years and passed away. I think it must have been just as you guys began airing in yeah. September. What was she like to work with? I didn't work closely with Diana because I wasn't on set at the time. Um, I heard a lot of stories about how wonderful she was and how much fun she was, um, but also what a consummate pro she was. You know, she was, she knew exactly what she was doing, um, had a wicked sense of humour about her, and she, she, uh, she's just a delightful person from everything I've heard and from what I've seen in the rush years. Um, she was just great and brought that energy onto the set, and it's a real, real shame um, and very sad for all of us. Um, particularly her family who obviously our, our thoughts are with more than anyone um but yeah she was really great and we were, we were so grateful that she she joined us even for the short period it was yeah i know it, it's so wonderful it'll be wonderful for our viewers to see those scenes of her um for those who don't know she's going to play mrs pumphrey a wealthy woman with a with a pampered dog um we're getting more questions uh, someone about actors. Someone wants to know how did we? How did you guys manage all the screaming that Siegfried does? He does do a lot of hollering. How did we manage it? Um, in, in what respect? In uh, in keeping his voice? Or I think well, I'm not sure what the the questioner means, but maybe just um, yeah. Was it? Yeah. Well, well, it's. I think that that Sam is a very intelligent actor and sort of was very carefully modulating his pitch so he wasn't always screaming that he would sort of there's different stages to Siegfried's rage and sort of explosions um which Sam works through but it's yeah he did lose his voice at one stage actually but I think that was more more to do with his cold than um his the actual shouting but yeah he, he does shout a lot but he's a Sam's a total pro he could um he could shout for a day and he'd be fine good lungs we, we've also got a question about, um, and I don't know anything about this. What do we know about the son? The author, did the author take his little boy to work? That must yeah. be Yeah. That must yeah. be. Yeah, down, down, down the way. Jim White, who's Alf White's son, um, ended up being a vet himself. Um, and he would, uh, I think there's, there's stories in the later books of, um, when Jim would be trying to go out on on visits with him and helping out, and so yeah, he he worked with his dad. Um, so yeah, he, it was a family. They both worked together for a period of their lives, and his daughter was a GP, which is a doctor. Oh, that's lovely. Well, he clearly loved his work, so why wouldn't the kids want yeah. to be carers of some yeah. kind? That's great. Um, we also have one person suggesting Yorkshire's like more like Alaska, which is interesting. I all I picture in Alaska is snow, but we haven't seen a lot of snow yet in all creatures. Um, I am going to actually take a pause here to introduce the GBH staffers who are running this event. Um, they are managing sort of the technology behind the scenes and they're connecting with you directly. Um, mostly you're not gonna see or hear them, but I just wanted you to see and hear them once. So first up, we have Jen Gilcrease. She's our event producer and she's overseeing the whole virtual production. Jen, say hello. Hi everyone, I'm Jen Gilcrease, event producer of the Beyond the Page series here at GBH. Thank you so much for joining us today, especially as we're testing out our first Sunday installment. So thank you. Uh, I'm just absolutely loving the conversation and I can't wait to get back to it. So back to you, Erin. I'd also like to introduce Bailey Tonini. She's keeping an eye on our Q&A question box. Bailey, say hello. Thanks, Erin. Hi everyone, I'm Bailey. I'm hanging in the Q&A. We want to hear all your questions and by asking your question you have to open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen where you can type it in. Be sure to let us know where you're tuning in from when you submit your question. 
see a question that you want to hear the answer to, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up. Thanks, everyone. We hope you enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you, Jen and Bailey. And now we're going to hear from Jamie Reese, volunteer and fundraising manager, about how you can continue to support GBH's efforts, not only beyond the page, but all the virtual events we continue to provide. Jamie, welcome. Thank you, Erin, and hello, um, our attendees to, at home. You know, thanks for spending some time with us during today's Beyond the Page event. You know, there's something so special about a community of people brought together by a memoir and a treasured series like Masterpiece. You know, the great thing about books and GBH is both are commercial free. GBH is member supported, and that means we're here because you want us here. Our commercial free status also means we count on your support. If you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustaining member, you'll receive an autographed copy of next month's featured book, All About the Story, by former executive of the Washington Post, Robert Downey Jr., as a thank you gift. You know, GBH and Beyond the Page aim to serve our audience in a way that not only educates, but also entertains, inspires, and shares diverse perspectives. We rely on financial support from members to keep offering programs like Masterpiece, trusted journalism, and virtual events like this one. Please give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, whatever works best for you and your budget. It's so easy. Just go to wgbh.org slash support events. You can also click on that link you see in the chat box right now and contribute what you can. And to those attendees who are already GBH members, thanks so much for your support now more than ever. And now back to Erin and Ben with more of today's Beyond the Page. Thanks, Jamie. And um, just everybody remember, use that Q&A tab, ask your questions. We have um, a really nice question from Mary, who says, I thought that Harriet did a wonderful job at characterizing the Dales farmers' culture and reserved nature, but, but did it in a very respectful and endearing way. And was this a challenge for the writing? No, no, because he, he did all the work. <laughs> he, um, he's a wonderful observer of humanity and he captures the spirit of the Dales so incredibly well and vividly in, in, his, in his books. Um, and I, I, they just feel so truthful, all those people. And, and um, there's not much, in fact, there's, well, there's very, there's hard, there's, I can't think of any, any malevolence in the series, really. It's like, there's no character that is um, mean-spirited. They might, they might be hard, or come, you know, be slightly harsh, but underneath it all, I think there's a warmth and kindness and sense of community that shines through. Um, so yeah, it was a real honor and pleasure actually to write about those people. I mean, I think um, uh, idiosyncratic people are much more fun than just the sort of the dull ones. And it's an incredibly idiosyncratic environment. It was great. Yeah, the, the line that we all love so much that sums that up is Siegfried's line about, it's not the animals that cause all the bother, it's the people. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's sort of an ongoing uh, theme, both in the book and the series of that you, you're treating both of them. You know, sometimes it, there, there, are, there are Dale's farmers who um, won't be told what's wrong with their stock. So as a vet, you have to sort of slightly massage the farmer as much as you are the animal to sort of get them to to treat them correctly and and to have them um and made better so yeah it's it's a it's a really interesting um role for the vet they're sort of therapists in a way as well as being um practitioners of, of medicine and also trying to earn a living i'm sure yeah yeah um and we've got a question from cindy moore who's asking what did you want to keep and what did you want to change from the first TV series based on the book series? How much did you even watch it? How much? I, yeah, I deliberately didn't go back and watch it. Actually, it was I kind of wanted to respond to the book as a as a fresh piece of adaptation. Um, I watched the Anthony Hopkins film, um, which is nineteen seventies film, which again is great, but also very different from how I remember the BBC one. Um, 
I suppose that the one thing that the I mean there's a few things, but the the scale that we're able to capture in in this series in terms of doing the Dales justice, um, the the previous series on the BBC was shot a lot more like a sitcom, I would suppose, with some exteriors, single camera exteriors, but the interiors felt a lot more um, studio based. And we wanted to sort of get the breadth and scale of the Dales, which now we can do much more easily. You know, it, 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 back then it would have been a, a helicopter to do a swooping shot of the drones, whereas now we can send up a drone in a, in a day. Um, so there was that element of it. And I also thought that there was, um, we could go slightly deeper with the characters and the world. I think that there's a, at times a harshness in the books and a, and uh, uh, that sort of the other side of reality that isn't always sugar coated, which wasn't as well represented in the previous version. So I think we're always looking to dig a little bit deeper to the truth of these characters in the world. Um, and especially with the female characters as well to really flesh those out and understand them more. Um, well, it shows on the screen, I can tell you. Uh, we are at Masterpiece. We're so excited about bringing this to our viewers. We have a question from Gay about, Ben, who is your favorite character and why? And also, which car character was hardest to capture in your writing? <laughs> that's a really, I love, that's a really difficult question. Um, and uh, I change my mind all the time. I love Siegfried. I love Mrs. Hall. In a weird way, you'll come to meet him. In a weird way, I really love Hugh as well, um, but for very different reasons. I think the one that's most fun to write would be maybe an easier, easier question to answer is Siegfried. He because he's someone that's always making things happen and lighting up the room and taking the story in a different direction. So I suppose the character I most enjoy writing is Siegfried, but. I love all of them in different ways. Mrs. Hall and the way Anna Maidley can pitch a whole story with a raised eyebrow is um, is something to behold. Uh, so yeah, it's a very difficult question, but Siegfried, Mrs. Hall, uh, I don't know. <laughs> so, it's sort of like asking you to name your favorite child or something. Yeah, it is a little bit, it is a little bit, yeah. Um, and then there's a question, this is a good question from Marilyn. How much of the first book does season one cover? Or, or is does the season one even cover just the first book? And what's the plan? That's a really great question and a difficult one to answer. Um, there are, we draw upon the first two books in series one and into series two at this stage. We. Um, take James to a certain, not everything that happens in the first book happens in the series, but there are things from the first book that do play out in the first series. I'm trying hard not to give any spoilers where we, where we end up, but yeah, they're, they're, I, I would say that sort of central journey of James arriving at the Dales and making it his home is the sort of the, the main strand of that first series. And that, and that draws on, parts of um, both those first two books. And our plan is to, to keep going. I think series two, we'll still, we're still drawing on those first two books. Um, because the other, the other reason why that's difficult to answer is because of the nature of the, the novels themselves being so vignette they do sort of move through time backwards and forwards. And at times he'll talk about something that happened many years later in and then the next episode will be when he arrived, you know, sort of um, six months after he arrived. So it's it's quite difficult to to fully say, yes, we've done book one. But I, I imagine we'll be using the first two books, at least for series one and two. I imagine series three, fingers crossed and God willing, um, we will be looking more at books two and three. Um, and, and, and that's sort of just, just natural as we use up all the vet stories as well from one um, and move on through the series. That makes perfect sense. He did jump around, you could tell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, we're getting two questions and I have this question too, the animals. Barbara uh, wants to know what you can tell us about the animals. Carol wants to know how did you arrange for those animals and animal scenes? I was 
I can say for myself, I was unbelievably impressed. They're so believable. I thought, oh my God, they got this young actor to actually stick his arm into a cow. He made it so believable, but I think probably he wasn't really doing it, right? No, and um, quite rightly, the law states that we can't do unnecessary procedures on animals um, that may cause them distress, especially if you're not a trained vet. So from the outset, we have to find ways of um, presenting these procedures in a way that was not in any way sort of um, harmful to the animals or contravening any of those rules. So that meant that we had to sort of mix prosthetic animals with the real animals. So there are close up prosthetics that we um, that we used as well as trained stunt cows that you know that we 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 became small holders as well as tv show makers in that we had to we bought a shop uh, a flock of sheep which were looked after and cared for and we had to buy a cow or two and these animals whenever we would buy them we also had to pay for people to look after them so we we kind of had a, men a menagerie of all these different animals um that we could call upon and use uh but i, I suppose a good way to talk about it is that there's a, a moment at the end of episode one where there's a sequence involving a, a procedure with a cow and to film that we had to use there were four cows and one prosthetic go into the making of that moment was it yes yeah so i won't tell you what happens because i'll spoil it but it, it, in that scene both in the preparation and the shooting in total there were four well yeah, four, four cows and one prosthetic that we then had to splice together to make the overall finish effect. So, yeah, we, you know, making a show like All Creatures Great and Small, we wanted to make sure the animals obviously were incredibly well cared for because it's a show for people who love animals and we're all making it because we love animals. So that was at the forefront of everything we did. And they were great. I mean, our animals were so well trained and, you know, we would have to teach a cow to lie down over a series of weeks so it would just stay in the scene lying down um and they were great the, the animals throughout were probably the the easiest apart from the logistics of the animals the actual animals themselves were great on screen and really well behaved well i wondered about that because they certainly seem so but i thought that must have been like take 23 after you guys tried and tried and tried but did it go smoothly yeah i mean it, 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 it genuinely the animals seem to be they're so well trained that there's a bull in episode one that you'll see helen wrestling well you know she sort of is leading a bull um and in the rushes of that the the, the bulls is so incredibly well behaved we were worried that it wasn't going to seem that scary um, it's supposed to be, you know, this is a huge animal that we're supposed to be intimidated by. And and yet it was so well behaved, you could struggle to believe that it was. Um, but yeah, the, the animals across the board were were great. I mean, there's occasionally, you know, you'd have to make sure we didn't have prey and hunter animals on set at the same time. So that was difficult. You wouldn't because you could never mix you know, something that might want to eat something else um so that juggling the logistics of it was the the most challenging thing actually right um did all the actors were they animal fans or at least not animal fearful uh animal fanatics uh, actually especially really? um rachel and callum i think really loved their dogs um and yeah they were all of them love animals um Sam has got a real sort of passion for rats as well. He's um, <laughs> he has a real sort of passion for rats. So yeah, they they all loved animals and not an ounce of fear. Rachel Shenton is is quite a petite woman, um, and I think it was the first thing she shot was leading this bull, which it it must have weighed a ton. It it was sort of it, its shoulders were higher than her head. Um, and she had to just grab hold of it and yank it around. And we always wanted sort of Helen to be introduced in a strong moment and uh, showing her in her environment as a farmer. Um, and, and Rachel just went straight in there and filled those Wellington boots up immediately. She was fantastic. Wow. So was this a, a question on your interview when you were casting? 
must no. love animals. We did, we did, we didn't, we didn't think of that actually. <laughs> There's so many other things you're you're thinking about. You kind of that that was taken for granted a little bit, but I think we checked the allergies because we didn't want to cast people that were allergic to animals because then that would become uh, make things very difficult. But yeah, I think everyone made it clear that they they loved animals. It wasn't really a question we had to ask because um, they're all so keen. Yeah. Now we've got a question from Gail about, um, she's remembering from the original series that some of the background characters were played by local non-actors. Is yeah. that true of the new series as well? I mean, they are local. I mean, with Beverly Keogh, our casting director is fantastic. She did um, Last Tango in Halifax, I think, and a, a few other the shows that are set up there. And she, what she's really great at is finding authentic voices. Um, and so they, a lot of back, a lot of the background are people who aren't actors. There are also people who are smaller parts that are locally sourced actors. Um, so yeah, whenever possible, we've gone as authentic as we can. Um, so yeah, the, the, we're exactly the same. That's great. And you can tell by the accents, Yeah, which sound fully legitimate. Um, in a, a shoot an interesting production shooting question, Gail is asking how you avoided the modern sort of electrical wires and poles and other things to get in the way of landscape and village shots. Yeah, I mean, it's again, really lucky with the area up there. There are some parts that are so unspoiled, you don't have to do very much. Um, it's still very rugged, rural. I mean, we had to dress Grassington, which is the, the, the real life village that we use for our Darabi. But those houses and cottages are, you know, 150, 200 years old. It's, you know, so they're still there. It's changing the fronting. And then we have to paint out a little bit. Um, you know, if you've got a telegraph pole in the background, you might have to, in the edit, effect, uh, visual effects, um, remove it. But they can do, there's so much they can do now with um, special effects for, for not very much. So yeah, it, it, we try whenever possible not to, not to get anything modern in frame, but we can also deal with it quite easily now. Yeah, I wondered how much um, visual effects you might have had to do. Not really much, but just the painting out of the odd. Yeah, I mean, there's there's some clever, there is some clever sort of uh, splicing together that's done. And that's also the, the visual effects to, to make, sell that and to, to make it all, it's, it's all very subtle, the VFX we've, we've had to do. Um, speaking of things that might or might not have worked when you hit when you hit the camera roll, um, the cars. There are a couple of magnificent yeah. old vintage cars that, and one of them is a sort of joke car, James's car. Yeah. But how on earth did you get? It looked to me like the actors were really driving, so they were yeah. operational vehicles. Yeah. How did you? How did you? train them and teach them and were they confident <laughs> well th they said they could drive you know it's like actors saying they can horse ride um so yeah there, there's at times there are stunt drivers um driving there's a there's a moment in episode two that requires a stunt in the driving um and through the magic of television there's actually those aren't the actual actors but it appears to be some of the time the car is being driven in fact all the time it's being driven yeah they 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 do it themselves and and they're great it's a beautiful the rover in fact that we which is siegfried's car got a beautiful sort of green rover um which we i think we own it because we had to do a stunt with it so as well as owning sheep we had to buy a vintage car for the show so I, and i've really got my eye on it i don't think i'm ever going to get it but um it's a beautiful beautiful thing and the, and the actors love it. They love getting behind the wheel and, and driving it. Um, but yeah, it, on, on the whole, it is, it is all them. That's great. I, I have some car lovers in my family who are coveting that Rover too. <laughs> um, I, want, I have a couple more questions as we, as we begin to wrap up. Um, one of them is, 
you guys filmed this before the world changed, right? I think you had pretty much completely finished shooting before the pandemic started, which we daily thank the timing gods for, but you must have had to do all the editing and the sound mixing and the color correction and all that if in lockdown, right? What was yeah. that like? How did that go? It's a tricky process. I think we had a lot done. You know, we, as you say, we were very lucky in that you know, we'd been editing and grading and coloring and mixing before we'd finished shooting. We'd already started on all the other episodes. So there wasn't a great deal left to be done. I mean, there's still a decent amount to be done, but it, it wasn't a terrifying amount. And we just had to adapt. A lot of Zoom meetings, a lot of uh, reviewing remotely, um, bringing actors into, occasionally the actors had to re-record lines um, for clarity and we'd have to sort of ferry them to sort of separate locations and they did not have to have any contact. They'd have to go in a separate door and go into a booth by themselves and record it by themselves with a sound engineer in a different room. And so it was complicated, but nowhere near as complicated as it would have been had we be shooting. And we're just grateful that we um, got the chance to finish. Yeah, that's wonderful. You also, I want everybody to know that you also managed to finish some behind the scenes interviews, which we at Masterpiece will be editing together and we'll be making little videos that we'll release throughout the series if you want more backstory and more sort of inside information on the series. Um, this, I, to me, this series is gonna air at a particularly perfect time. It is winter, there is a pandemic, and we get to spend seven Sunday evenings in this lovely place with these lovely people. And a question I have for you and several of our attendees have the same question is basically, what do you think it is about the books that gives them this unbelievably enduring appeal. And the second part of that question is how is the story from 1937 and the 30s relevant today? I think it sort of captures the enduring spirit of humanity. And, you know, the, the stories are written with such heart and warmth and the relationships between man and animal is something which goes across generations and, and you know it's it's the stories of of human existence and I think Harriet really captures um that part of humanity and he and reflects it back back at us in a way that's entirely timeless and I especially think now when we are you know in the situation we are and everyone I think um is thinking more about community and their lives and their places in the world in a way that perhaps we weren't you know, just a year and a half ago. So for that reason, I think it's really timely and um, a great pleasure to be bringing this out now. I hope you guys enjoy it. Yeah, I'm totally in agreement. Tonight, uh, January 10th happens to be the exact 50th anniversary of Masterpiece, 9 no p.m. tonight. It was 50 years ago today that Alistair Cook first said, good evening. And I can't think of a better series to kick off that anniversary. It, it's got really everything that we love about Masterpiece. We love the writing, we love the characters, we love the story, and we love the, the fact that these people care about each other and they care about doing the right thing. It's just, um, it's a delight. So thank you. Thank you pleasure. so much ben, for bringing it to us. It's a real pleasure. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna thank Ben and I'm going to ask everybody else to um, thank you in advance for tuning in tonight, which I'm sure you all will. Um, and I want to ask you to join us, the Beyond the Page book club, over the coming weeks as we take a dive into our February selection. We'll be reading another memoir next month, but this time it's of Leonard Downey Jr., an American journalist and executive editor of the Washington Post from 1991 to 2008. That virtual conversation will take place on Thursday, February 25th at 7 p.m. That's Eastern time. Um, also, don't forget to join our Beyond the Page Facebook group for even more discussion topics as you read the novel. And now another quick message from Jamie on how you can show your support. Hello again, everyone. 
Thanks so much for joining us this afternoon and a very special shout out to today's virtual attendees who are also GBH members. All donations, both great and small, from viewers, listeners, and virtual event attendees helps keep us going. Today, we have a special offer for event attendees who would like to become a GBH supporter. If you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, you will receive an autographed copy of All About the Story by Leonard Downey Jr., who is former executive editor of the Washington Post. And this book we hope you'll accept as a token of our appreciation. You, yes, you at home can help bring more stories to light on TV, radio, and digital platforms. Please visit wgbh.org slash support events to make a donation all at once or in $5 monthly installments. Just click that link you see in your chat right now to be brought to our donation site. Please donate today in any amount to become a GBH investor. Now more than ever, your commitment really makes a difference. Thank you everyone and have a great day. So we look forward to connecting with you all again and we hope you and your family are staying healthy, both physically and emotionally during this difficult time. Thank you. <laughs>